Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you all for joining us today for our Monash Prato Dialogue Distinguished Lecture Series in Artificial Intelligence. I'm Professor Joanna Batstone, the Director of the Monash Data Futures Institute at Monash University, and I will be your host and moderator. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're in essence virtually gathered here today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Please also join us today in the conversation on social media by following us on Twitter at MonashDFI and by using the hashtag MonashPratoDialogue. The Monash Data Futures Institute is the largest interdisciplinary community of AI and data science thought leaders in Asia Pacific, and we're committed to excellence in shaping the future of the field. Within the Institute, our focus areas include the use of data-driven AI across research in governance and policy, sustainable development and health sciences. This new Monash Prato Dialogue Distinguished Lecture Series aims to explore the evolving impact of data science and AI in society by fostering a global dialogue. The series takes its name from Monash University's center in Prato, Italy, that represents an international base for research, education, intellectual and cultural exchanges, and enables us to bring people together to meet, learn and collaborate with peers and colleagues from around the world. You've joined us today for the third lecture in this series, where we are very pleased to host Professor Virginia Dignam. Professor Dignam is the Professor of Responsible Artificial Intelligence at Umeå University in Sweden, and she's also associated with TU Delft in the Netherlands. She's the Scientific Director of the Wallenberg Programme on Humanities and Society for AI, which is the largest Swedish national research programme of fundamental multidisciplinary research on the societal and human impact of AI. Professor Dignam has received many awards and recognition for her work, including the 2006 prestigious Veni grant by the Dutch Organization for Scientific Research, and she's a founding member of the Dutch AI Alliance. She's also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, a fellow of the European Artificial Intelligence Association and a member of the European Commission High Level Expert Group on Artificial Intelligence, the Working Group on Responsible AI for the Global Partnership on AI. She's part of the World Economic Forum's Global Artificial Intelligence Council, lead for UNICEF's Guidance for AI and Children and the Executive Committee of the IEEE Initiative on Ethically Aligned Design. Professor Dignam is a well-known speaker on the social and ethical impacts of AI, and many of you will have read her book on responsible artificial intelligence, published by Springer Nature in 2019. Today, Professor Dignam will discuss the need to work towards technical and social legal solutions that help AI practitioners in aligning their systems with our society's principles and values. We're very pleased to welcome Virginia today, Thanks for joining us. Over to you, Virginia. Thank you very much, Joanne. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, everybody, to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion later. And let me start by sharing my slides. Uh, good, good morning, like I say, or good evening there in uh, Australia. It's a pity uh, we have to do it online. I would have lo looked forward to being in Mel Melbourne yet again this year, but it seems we have to wait one more year. Anyway, so indeed I'm going to speak today about responsible artificial intelligence and how can we move from the, the principles that have been uh, discussed and introduced by many organizations in the world, from UNESCO to the European Union to uh, the uh, World Economic forum to many countries many other organizations but we, we really need to start moving from these principles to action to operationalize them and to make sure that they are integrated in the ai systems and applications that are increasingly leading and shaping our lives but before we talk about what is responsible artificial intelligence and how we can move from these principles to action 
we have to start by talking about what is artificial intelligence. And depending on who you talk and depending on what you read, many, many different interpretations of AI come forward from magic to business as usual, usually containing some uh, uh, indication of systems that are adaptable, interactive and autonomous. My uh, purpose today is not to, to define AI, that is kind of an impossible um, endeavor, but actually to talk about what AI is not and what AI is not from the perspective of defining and understanding responsibility in this field. So what AI is not, is not artificial and is not intelligent. It's not artificial because these type of systems are dependent and uh, um, based on uh, a myriad of people, uh, a myriad of uh, infrastructures and uh, cannot run, cannot exist without these people in these infrastructures. Actually, just recently, Kate Crawford in her uh, Atlas of AI book, which I uh, will uh, recommend to you, has made a very clear and very uh, sound uh, exposition of all the, the, the cases and all the, the ways that AI is not artificial. We need people to take the data, we need people to collect the data, we need infrastructures to run and uh, maintain this data, we need uh, ground materials to build our computers and our systems, we need people to uh, design the system. So uh, there is a lot of not artificial on AI. AI is also not intelligent, at least not in the way that we consider a person to be intelligent. AI is extreme and increasingly AI systems are uh, in increasingly better than people at uh, identifying patterns on data, on making predictions on these patterns in ways and, and, uh, that we would not be able to do or in a different ways and identifying other types of patterns and what we would do. But still, for a large majority, these systems are not able to understand the meaning of those patterns that they are seeing. They can identify cats in pictures, they can identify identify cancer cells in scans, they can identify all kinds of um, 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 relations in data, but still they will not be able to tell you what is a cat and why is a cat different from a cancer cell. So intelligence is quite far from these systems. Also, if we consider that human intelligence is not just about the ability to perform cognitive tasks, but also is about emotional social and biological uh, intelligence. And there, these systems are really, really, really very far from, um, fr from being intelligent. But it's okay, it's not what we uh, actually expect from these systems. But what is important to realize is that all, any AI system is not alone in itself, doesn't stone in itself, and it's part of a social technical ecosystem. It contains the people, the organizations, the institutions that develop, run and govern these type of systems. So when we talk about responsible AI, we do need to address not the, the software, not the technical system, but really this social technical environment in which the system exists. We have to address the organizations, the people, the institutions, institutions alongside as trying and aiming to develop uh, responsibility and um, so, uh, ethical behavior or legal behavior by design. So responsible artificial intelligence starts with the realization that indeed we can potentially do a lot with AI, but uh, the question is, and some people are calling this the question zero, the question is, uh, is the, the fundamental question is, should we use AI when and where? And of course, with this, this question, which is, like I said, the, the core question before any system should be considered, the core, the, it is based, of course, in, um, in a power uh, structure. And those who have the power to decide whether or not to use AI are also the ones who have the power to shape how AI is going to be used. So we do, do need to uh, include in this question, the question of whether or not to use AI in a certain uh, situation, we need to include in this question, the, the questions about who are those that are going to decide? Which values and those values are we going to, to consider? 
how do we deal with the dilemmas when we cannot in, in, incorporate all the desirable values and how can we prioritize these values? All these questions are questions which need to address by, by those in the social ecosystem around the AI system and are questions which will uh, change, uh, the answers will uh, be quite substantially different depending on who you ask. So it is very important to have uh, an inclusive and participatory perspective when we are de dealing with this type of system. Because like I say, the ones who have the power are the ones who shape the, the system, the ones who shape our futures. Uh, some cases in which we, we talk, we should start talking about responsibility when we should talk, start talking about the impact of AI in our systems. And often when we talk or someone mentions uh, ethics in AI, uh, the first thing that comes to mind in many of us is the questions of the, the trolley problems or the, the issues about what should a self-driving car do in a situation in which it cannot stop anymore. But that's only a small subject set of uh, problems and maybe not even the most interesting or the most relevant type of problems. Uh, we should consider the responsibility in AI, for instance, when chatbots are being deployed and developed. Uh, sorry. Uh, issues of mistaken identity, is it okay, is it not okay, uh, when is it potentially possible to uh, make a user think that it potentially might be uh, talking with a person uh, instead of talking with a machine. And there are many, many voices and many opinions in this case. And therefore, we do need to, to consider all these uh, possibilities. Also, issues of manipulating emotions, of uh, aiming at uh, behavior change support, and in most cases with a medical or therapeutic uh, uh, intentions are all issues that need to be considered from the perspective of responsibility, from the perspective of ethics, from the perspective of um, individual um, uh, self-determination. Issues of automated decision making, and we have seen many, many cases in which automated decision making has gone not in the ways that we expect, not in desirable ways, has gone completely wrong, let's say. Issues here that we need to consider is issues of accountability. It can never be that for the user, the, the excuse or the explanation is, sorry, the computer said no. And we do know, and we all have in our lives been uh, faced with this which cannot be acceptable and cannot be, uh, 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 the, can never be the case. Also, in all this automated decision making uh, systems that we are building nowadays, we, uh, they are mostly data driven, and data driven is always using data that has been collected in the past, it can be the very, very uh, near past, but data is always about the past. And therefore, we might be condemned to repeat that past, including all the bias and exclusion issues that come with that data. So we really need to look at issues of bias, exclusion, uh, diversity, and so on. Uh, the issue of power, I already talked about it. So the, the, who, who has the power to decide is the one to shape this type of system. So how can we agree on the definitions? How can we agree on the what, when and how to use this type of systems? And who are those which can decide? And can we trust those that decide? And finally, again, the issue of the dilemmas between the different values that need to be balanced. And usually a system doesn't, is never built to only adhere to one value, but we really need to balance issues, for instance, of privacy or security. If we cannot have both, how are we going to ensure that we maximize and balance between those two? Issues of accuracy, and especially in AI research, the, the drive for uh, wielding yet more accurate systems is something which really drives research, which really drives application. But we ne really need to start thinking about the balance between this drive for accuracy and the uh, sustainability and the climate change and the energy consumption. So if um, accuracy with a tiny percentage, uh, a, a tiny tenth of a percentage requires uh, many uh, more, 50 more percent uh, uh, use of energy, is that still a, a desirable uh, 
aim for accuracy and how can we then uh, uh, choose accuracy or uh, address accuracy in ways that are less energy and uh, data con consuming. So these are all questions that need to be addressed uh, and uh, cases in which we really need to start uh, thinking about responsibility, about ethics, about the, the legal, the social, societal and ethical impact of uh, the systems that have been developed and used, just as examples. Because ethics is actually not just about uh, giving an answer, it's about recognizing that we are in a situation in which an ethical decision needs to be taken. And we know from philosophy that uh, there are not one single answer to any problem. Any ethical theory comes with different motivations, different groundings, different explanations, different uh, ways of uh, address the problem. And uh, we cannot, it, all of them might potentially re lead to a different uh, answer, but uh, uh, with a potentially or equally valid uh, motivation. So the issue is not so much about trying to build systems that have the ethical answer to any specific issue, but really recognizing that the system might be in a situation in which uh, its behavior, its uh, results uh, are. Um, um, have ethical uh, consequences and of course the responsibility for the that the how to address that question should be a, a, a responsibility that lies with us the developers the the, um, the policy makers the the deployers of the systems the providers of the systems the the designers of the systems and all of those involved in the in the process which decisions, uh, again, the responsibility is considering and thinking about which decisions should the AI system make. We want AI systems that help us with uh, determining and supporting our motives, or do we want AI systems that want to support us with def determining the plans for our actions? Do we want AI systems that address what is best for me, the single user, or do we want AI systems that address what is best for us as a group or as a society? And we all know that the answer to, or the, the answers in these two cases can be quite different. At the same time, we really need to address the issue of uh, and uh, consider that in many cases, the, the, the situations, the, the answers, the, the possible um, uh, ways to address the situation uh, require to understand that uh, not every time every, things that are morally acceptable are also socially accepted those cases and also in many cases and uh, along uh, changing with time changing with culture changing with the region of the world what is ethically acceptable is not always uh, legally allowed and what is legally allowed then is not always morally acceptable and you just have to think about issues of uh, death penalties issues of um, smoking in public as well and all issues that have changed their um, their position in this space. And as well, like I referred already before, we do need to address the situation in which we cannot have it all, in which we have to make a choice between different values, and we have to prioritize these values in different ways. And all these decisions are decisions which are part of the design of the systems, are part of the running of the systems, but cannot be solved by the software system itself. And in, in a sense, is, are issues that we have dealt in many other uh, uh, types of systems that we people have developed before. So we, we do are aware and we have many cases in which systems, complex systems that have been developed, and I'm not talking now only about software systems, but about many other types of societal and uh, organizational uh, systems. We know that the impact, the, the, the way we design these systems impact the way decisions are taken, decisions are uh, perceived, which then impacts the society, or the, the group, the, the, the environment in which these systems are uh, acting and again depending the society will depend on the type of designs that are available so uh, i just want here to briefly give um 
uh, parallel between the way we design democratic processes and the way we design AI systems and how much they are similar in the, uh, in the, the potential uh, and the, the ways that we need to develop them to address trust and to uh, get to, the, 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 in both cases, the issue is that social acceptance and trust is required. And that depends, and we know uh, many cases in which both of them go completely wrong, and I'm not going into the details of the examples in the pictures, but this, the, the fact that they go wrong, or the fact that they don't go wrong, has a lot to do with this issue of trust and social acceptance, which is determined by the choices that are given to those, uh, to the systems, the way we formulate these choices, the information that is available to the system or to the voters in the case of the democratic systems in terms of the, the ways that they can uh, understand and address those choices they need to make it also depends a lot on the involvement of those uh, which are able to take the decisions the legitimacy of those that are putting the system forward and the way that the system aggregates the different opinions and the different uh, views on how uh, the solution uh, let's say the, the result needs to be uh, calculated and uh, we have uh, understood for many years how to deal with that in uh, democratic processes and i think that we can learn from the, the way that we develop this democratic process uh, in the ways that we need to address the development and design of ai and that means that it's not about being 100 percent correct not being uh, accurate at all costs, but really to understand how to uh, combine uh, accuracy with uh, acceptance and trust. Because there are many concerns, and uh, many of these concerns are, have been uh, addressed by in many in many different ways in uh, in uh, by by many authors by many uh, uh, many uh, organisations. The issues of bias is one which is increasingly more more relevant, more important. And how much does the training data for the AI systems reflect those that are going to use or that are going going to be uh, the focus? of the decisions of the systems and how can we ensure that uh, all are included in a, a equal and a balanced ways in the data uh, that is used for the training issues of explanation we do need to uh, develop explanations increasingly in a more user-centered way it's not giving the, the explanation that is the most um, uh, easy for the developer to achieve but one which is just in time clear and concise for those that are requiring the explanation so it needs to be contextual uh, issues of diversity and especially diversity in the ones that are developing ai systems and i just have there some numbers they are a bit old but i don't think unfortunately that much has changed in these numbers but also about the motivations and the drive for those that are developing and um, uh, deploying AI systems. We really need to have a much bigger diversity of motivations and a much, much bigger diversity of those involved in deciding on the, on the motives, on it, deciding on this question zero that I just uh, talked about. Also issues of sustainability, something which the last few years really has been uh, increasing in, uh, in the discussions. What is the cost of AI? How much is AI uh, able to help us solve our problems or is AI adding to the problems, for instance, in the climate change and so on. So we really need to address that and numbers, at least from some, uh, some studies, are not really very um, encouraging, like you can say in the picture. So responsible AI about understanding that we have to develop AI systems, and we have to use AI systems in ways that are lawful, aligned with the law, that are ethical, aligned with the, the ethics and the morals and the, the values of the societies and the, the human rights of uh, people in general. Uh, we also, but it's also about uh, realizing that these systems need to be uh, reliable. We need to build systems that can be trusted, that are robust, that are uh, uh, computationally sound. 
also understanding that systems should be beneficial. And here again comes the discussion about beneficial how and the beneficial for whom. But again, from the perspective of those that develop these systems, those that are deploying these systems, we need to ensure that the systems are verifiable, that all of this, that the lawfulness, ethical ethics, reliability, and so on, are verifiable in ways that can be uh, explained and uh, motivated to others. So if you go back to the original picture of the, this uh, social technical ecosystem, including the AI, uh, AI systems, then uh, responsibility is about ensuring that uh, there is somewhere where responsibility is defined in every time that we are developing autonomous systems that have some level of autonomy, that there is th some transparency when we are developing systems that adapt, that learn, that change, that uh, update themselves, and that there is some accountability when systems are interacting with us and are interacting with the environment. How we develop these issues is uh, the the focus of the work in responsible AI and it's definitely not uh, um, an answer or a solution that is only uh, technical. We really need to look at accountability, responsibility and transparency, the so-called art principles, to look at them not only from a technical uh, computational perspective but mostly from a societal perspective, an organizational and a policy perspective. And indeed, there are many organizations which are aware of these issues. And actually, there are many, many different types of principles. There are many, many organizations coming forward with principles, with guidelines, with declarations in terms of what, for, from the perspective of this organization, from the perspective of this country, from the perspective of this institution, uh, is what we should understand as uh, responsible or trustworthy or ethical uh, or beneficial AI, and they all give uh, different names. Uh, the good news is that, yes, it's good that so many are uh, aware of the need for this type of, uh, of uh, definitions. Uh, it's also good to see that because these principles are defined at such a high level of um, abstraction, that they are not so different from each other. At the end of the day, no one wants to, uh, to have unethical or irresponsible AI system. So in that day, they all agree. Uh, the issues are a lot in the details, but the most, and I think the most important issue today and uh, for, the, for the coming time is to understand how to interpret and how to guarantee that this type of principles of fairness, of human rights, of accountability, of uh, security and safety and so on, how are we translating these issues into the systems that are being used and developed? And again, I'm talking about this social technical system and not just about the software. Because these principles at the end of the day are principles for us, not for the software itself. And uh, we see also a lot of uh, interest, a lot of motivation by uh, uh, organizations and uh, governments around the world to uh, endorse this type of principles and uh, this, type, this type of pictures appear again and again. But in a sense, endorsement is just a start. It's not yet compliance and is not yet uh, the guarantees to uh, operationalize this type of issue. So we really need to move from this endorsement, from the definition of these systems into compliance and into operationalization. There are many different proposals and they, 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 there is a lot of work on this at the moment. There are issues of regulation, so let's uh, define regulations, define laws that uh, uh, guarantee the type of systems that we want to see and that we, we see here in Europe. Just a few months ago, the European Commission has launched this AI Act, which is now uh, soon to be discussed at the European Parliament. So it's a, a human-centered, risk-based approach which aims at regulate AI systems as we want them to be developed and used within the European uh, uh, Union uh, 
uh, within the European Union. But there are the regulation is definitely not the only way to address uh, operationalization of responsibility and uh, accountability. Uh, there are many organizations working on standards uh, uh, from the IEEE, the ISO, and other ones, which are, in a sense, ways that organizations, that company, that corporates understand, because standards is is standard in the in the operation of corporates. So it's a, it's a way that it's also taking a lot of traction uh, in many, especially in larger industry, in larger corporates, the, the multinationals are coming forward with advisory panels, ethic uh, chief ethic officers, and so on, which are able to within the organization set and monitor their ethical guidelines, their principles. Of course, we have seen in the media uh, many cases in which this goes potentially wrong, in which this might be considered the ethics washing, but still there are sufficiently um, uh, evidence that organizations uh, are uh, taking this seriously, and this is an option that needs to be considered as a way to uh, ensure from uh, um, institutional or organ organizational perspective, adherence and the monitoring of uh, ethical principles. Then there are a lot of work also in assessment tools, assessment uh, um, frameworks to, uh, to check the maturity, to check the level of uh, development of different uh, types of uh, responsibility uh, and um, accountability in the AI systems. Uh, we need to understand that uh, responsible AI is much more, much more than just ticking boxes in a list, but we do need to uh, work increasingly in this uh, means and uh, metrics to assess the maturity and the level of um, eti uh, the ethical uh, principles uh, within a certain system. Uh, and uh, of course, at the basis of it all, and uh, it's a, a work that really requires urgent attention and much, much more work than what is happening now, is the issue of awareness and participation. If people are not aware of what AI systems are, what AI systems are influencing their lives, uh, how they can participate, then of course uh, they remain outside of the discussion, remain outside of the, the participation. So we really need to uh, increase the efforts to uh, create aware raise awareness in, a, in all, uh, increase the, the the efforts to provide a more multidisciplinary education, both to those the engineers who are developing the systems, but also for others in other disciplines, in humanities and the social science, to understand that they do have. Um, a task to perform in the uh, definition, in the, uh, the, the setting the responsibility and the um, uh, accountability and ethical, uh, ensuring that AI systems are developed in an ethical uh, way aligned with human rights. It is also important to realize that responsibility, that ethics, that all these uh, discussions is definitely not against innovation. And that is a, a, a complaint that we hear, especially from uh, industry a lot, that yes, it's great that you come with all these regulations, with all these uh, proposals for uh, the guidelines and the um, principles, but at the end of the day, that is going to be against our uh, potential for innovation. I really like to uh, to uh, say, to go against this type of uh, beliefs. Uh, I see that innovation and uh, regulation and um, uh, this type of principles, if set well, if set with uh, the, can be really seen as an incentive for, in for innovation as a stepping stone for innovation. So if we uh, cannot develop systems in one way or another, because that is perceived as being less responsible, less uh, not uh, inducing of fairness and uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, repeating biases, if that is not possible with the technique that we were planning, then this is from a research, from an innovation perspective, exactly the way to, uh, to start thinking about alternatives, to innovate, to create those alternatives when they are potentially then not at this moment. You can also see it as business differentiation, and often I talk about the, the, the free-range eggs in the supermarket. If you go to the supermarket, you have a huge 
differentiation in the types of eggs that you can buy. All of them are uh, um, a case for a, a choice from business to uh, invest in a certain type of principles. We can look at AI systems and at uh, responsibility in AI systems in similar ways, because at the end of the day, we really can see and we need to look at principles and regulation as a drive for transformation, which will lead to better, better solutions and to a return on investment. So we can take responsibility in many different ways. We can look at the process by which AI is developed and uh, implemented and used in our in, um, in context. We can look at responsibility in the behavior of the results of uh, this, uh, these systems, the ethics by design, the privacy by design, the legal protection by design are all types of examples in which we look at implementing the responsibility into the systems and for some parts of the responsible uh, spectrum that is possible but still we do need to integrate with the responsibility within the design and develop and the use processes. And at the same time, of course, we really need to have the responsibility for what we are developing, for what we are uh, 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 implementing, uh, managing, uh, uh, procuring, and so on. So the, the role for all the stakeholders also in this responsibility. Uh, ways to do it, and there are several uh, approaches, for instance, one which is very much uh, used and in which I also have worked quite a lot, especially, uh, and it's uh, uh, also very, uh, um, very much focus of the research at the Delft University of Technology, is this design for values methodology, is understanding that the, this high level abstract values, uh, understanding and implementing this uh, and uh, using this high level abstract values like fairness, like privacy, like justice, requires a uh, interpretation into the context and this interpretation then needs to be implemented into the specific uh, functionalities of the systems. All of this interpretation and implementation are choices and given that are choice there are possible alternatives so we really need to look at ways in which we can make this evaluative, measurable and implementable and also uh, comparable one, the, the, the different choices and the different, op, the different um, uh, options uh, need to be compared and measured uh, along many different types of criteria. Uh, so as I have referred to already before, the fact that values are abstract and high level, that we really need to focus on understanding of uh, making these choices and these interpretations explicit and contextual, and also making our efforts to transparency and to explanation, again, being explicit, contextual, and uh, allowing for the different interpretations in the different contexts. What we are seeing nowadays is that efforts at algorithmic transparency and at explainable AI often focus on the implementation only and are not su suitable to understand this um how we the interpretation stands. So we really need to broaden up, broaden up the way that uh, algorithmic transparency and uh, explanation is being done. Another way to look at it is by taking a design stance and how to, how to design these systems, what kind of criteria and what kind of requirements do we need to include in our designs of the systems. Uh, we need to look at uh, the systems from the perspective and the design from the perspective that we, these designs need to guarantee the validation of what we are doing, even when we cannot rely on knowing exactly how the internal structures are. So, uh, the issues of black boxes and it's important to ensure that the black boxes are as transparent as possible but still we always will encounter issues of security issues of uh, um, 
intellectual property issues of the extremely complex system. So we do need to guarantee and to work on validation and evaluation of these systems from uh, in the, what we call internal independence. So not really relying only on the uh, fact that we might need to know what are these internal structures. At the same time, we really need to also include uh, independence from the interaction. So we need to be able to verify the system even if they are uh, used and uh, considered in many different approaches and are being included in many different types of, uh, as a component in many different types of systems. So the interactions of the systems with each other, the systems with the context, the systems with the, the their users uh, need to be taken in, in all, all the all those differences need to be taken into account and also we need to account on uh, ensure that audit of these systems can be done in many different ways it's not just a computational issue it's just not just a legal issue it's not just an organizational issue but we really need to include uh, different ways to uh, develop and to guarantee this, the auditing of uh, ai systems uh, i think i skip this one given the uh, time because i want to give time for the questions just to give you a very short uh, overview of what we are doing in my own research group at the university so we are looking at the these issues of verification and especially verifications through observation of the inputs and outputs of systems and uh, trying to see how much can we uh, guarantee and understanding how much the alignment of the system is with this interpretation uh, of the values in terms of the requirements for the system without uh, focusing too much on the operational design of the system so we're really looking at the input and output so this uh, internal independence that I just referred to. We are developing tools for assessment and monitoring, continuous and contextualized, and uh, in ways that uh, not only uh, uh, assess but also provide uh, um, uh, um, uh, evaluation of the maturity level of the system, the, uh, the maturity level of the, the, the responsibility, the interpretations, and how can that be uh, improved and uh, uh, continuously uh, uh, monitored. We are also looking at uh, social simulations, and in that is application of uh, AI systems in a participatory way to uh, address uh, policy uh, policy impact, to address policy design. The, the screenshot that I give there is from a work that we did to uh, support policymakers understand the impact of uh, corona-related uh, policies and how the, the social aspects need to be taken into, con in, into consideration alongside the epidemiologic uh, effects and the uh, so through a simulation of the of societies I'd say a small city in that case uh, but we are also trying to work on the issue of awareness of providing uh, the the, the information, the knowledge about AI, about responsible AI in many different ways. We have this uh, series of uh, seminars on every Friday at the lunch, European lunchtime. So for you, it's probably not the best time of the day, but it's a 45 minute discussion every, every Friday. And we have had uh, participants from industry, from uh, research, PhD students, uh, top professors, top researchers in the world. The tomorrow will be uh, but, um, uh, talk by the responsible AI department at the H&M um, organization, the, the close uh, company. Uh, so it goes all over, the, uh, and the, uh, all over the, the, the spectrum and it's quite, uh, it's open to everybody and it's usually a very lively discussion. So this is just to give you a, a very uh, short flavor of the type of research and efforts that we are doing. But I would like to finalize now with this uh, 
plea for a much more multidisciplinary way forward. So we really need to include, like I said at the beginning, not on the technical disciplines. The, as an engineer, we cannot answer all the questions and all the issues that come from taking into account the responsibility and the, um, accountability and ethics, legal and so on. So we really need to uh, ensure that there is uh, across the range, across the disciplines, the need to understand the and criticize critic, a critic, critical uh, understanding of the unforeseen, the positive and negative consequences of AI. We need to look more and more at governance, so we cannot really guarantee a full uh, and hundred percent reliability in nothing in the world. So we really need to look at governance in terms of competence and responsibilities. Also look at the issues of uh, power imbalance and power structures, understanding the legal, uh, societal and economic uh, aspects of the systems, uh, increasing the value about this type of value-based design, about what type of ethical frameworks are useful to be uh, taken into account or not. Uh, issues of inclusion and diversity, issues of uh, um, um, human-machine communication interaction. Uh, uh, AI systems will be increasingly ubiquitous in our society. So we really need also to look at uh, new ways to uh, understand uh, human-machine interaction in any ways. These are all questions which require really a multidisciplinary approach, one in which uh, many different disciplines come together to, uh, to provide the best way to understand these issues. Uh, so it, it starts with the idea that we, we do can do a lot with AI. We do, uh, first, as a question, the question zero, we need to understand, to ask the question, should we be using AI? And uh, with this question comes the, the power uh, uh, relations and the power structures that uh, mean that those that can answer this question are also the ones who are going to shape the way AI is being used. AI is not magic, magic is an artifact, is a tool, is a system that we people build, that we are part of, but also that we set the purpose for these type of systems. At the end of the day, AI can give us all kinds of answers, but we need ourselves to be able to write, to ask the right questions and to discuss what is a right question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Virginia. That was absolutely fascinating and uh, really enjoyed that. Thank so thank you for joining us. Thank you. We, we have a good, a good set of questions that have come in. And so we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can, but apologies in advance if we don't get through all of them. I'd like to start, Virginia, with a discussion. You just mentioned power again in your closing remarks. And you mentioned power at the beginning of your lecture. And so one of the questions that has come in from Rosamund is around whose power is the relevant or preeminent one? Is it the functional one in algorithms and processes? Is the power, the economic power associated with ownership of AI? Or is it in fact sort of the effective political power within the environment in which the AI operates? Yeah. And so you've talked about power a lot. I wondered if you could comment yeah. on that. Sure. It's a very good question. Thank you very much, Rosamond. Very, very good question. Uh, indeed, what we see at this moment, the power, uh, the, the power in, uh, in AI is a power of the, the, the ones who, who own the data, the ones who have the data, and the ones who have the potential to build this type of systems. These are typically large inter, uh, multi, multinational organizations or large, very large organizations. The, 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 tech, uh, the tech organizations, which I don't need to say the names because you all know what they are. They are typically uh, private uh, actors. They are uh, companies, they are corporates. They are not the uh, organizations which are uh, uh, possible or uh, uh, part of our democratic structures. So uh, we do see an increasing imbalance between the power that these companies have to 
determine what AI we are using, when are we using AI systems, how are we using AI systems, and we are seeing a, a divide between this power and the political power, the democratic, the, the power of the democratic elect, the governments and organizations to monitor, to um, to audit, to uh, regulate this type of organizations. And this is growing. And in the sense that is the, the, an issue that really needs to, um, to answer, uh, to, to need to be uh, addressed uh, more and more uh, urgently. There is this new, uh, new organization, the Global Partnership on AI, which has been launched by, it started with the G7 countries, the, the seven uh, most in the industrial countries in the world, in the European Union, uh, and is now including many different countries across the world. And their ambition is really to, uh, to include as many countries in the world as a, a partnership, as a, a way to, uh, start the dialogue with the, those that are developing the AI, AI systems, those that are owning and managing the data, to start that dialogue in a more balanced and equal uh, foot, uh, footage way. So there, there are efforts there, but indeed we are seeing that the power is not where the democratic uh, institutions are at this moment. Thanks very much, Virginia. Another interesting question from Leo that's just come in, uh, very relevant to this discussion around ethics. And the question is, why should we expect ethics in AI systems to be any better than ethics in all of our pre-AI systems? I mean, is it really the same we question? No, we shouldn't. I mean, uh, the, the AI systems has no ethics other than the ethics that we uh, build into it. Uh, they don't, they, they are not better than us in ethics. They can be, it's also like I said, the, the ethical answer can never be answered by the, the software, by the AI system. It's the answer and the responsibility for us, for our organization. So the, even if the system, uh, whatever the, the, the answer, whatever the result of the system, the interpretation of this result needs to be uh, one which is uh, done by, by human organizations, by the so, social ecosystem around it. So it's not, uh, not a question of whether AI is better, uh, has better ethics than we have, but it's really about how do we want to uh, address the, uh, the results or the answers that AI systems give, and how are we going to interpret that in our uh, societies, in our, in our um, daily life. Thanks. And, and a related question really with respect to the public is around accuracy. You know, how do we educate the public that our AI solutions are in essence providing an error bounded probability rather than a definitive conclusion? And so is there a, a role for us to do a different style of education for the public around what AI is really all about? Uh, definitely, when the, uh, I start my uh, my presentation by saying that AI can go all over from the magic to the business in, in the, as usual, and the public tends to be in one of the two extremes. So those who are not directly involved in the development, the design or the study of this type of systems in one way or another from whatever discipline, so let's say the, the, the person in the street, uh, uh, tend to be uh, believing one or the other extreme, believing that it's some kind of magic. You don't really understand what it is, but it seems to do something correct. We just have to uh, to accept what it does, and as a kind of a crystal ball. Uh, or uh, they tend to believe, oh, it's just some business as usual, is the, the what we always have had, and it's just uh, those computational systems being a bit more efficient than they were before. Uh, the, the truth, like we all know, it's somewhere in the middle, but we really need to uh, educate, to uh, raise the awareness of the, the public in terms of understanding what is this middle. And this middle is definitely not the, the crystal ball or the 100% the, the accurate answer in all cases. And it's very much a, a matter of understanding that uh, what we put in, the, the data that we provide the systems with, is for a large part determine the answers that we get. 
So if you only give the system information about red squares, we cannot really expect the system to say something relevant about blue triangles. Uh, and the, the, there is no magic there that all of a sudden makes the system understand all about triangles if it ever only learned about squares. Uh, and of course, in many other types of uh, examples like that. So we do need to look at uh, education awareness training as one of the priorities in order to uh, raise the, the awareness, but also in order to make um, uh, people understand that uh, this, these systems are not magic, but they really are dependent on our, uh, our choices and our priorities. Thank you. We started off today's lecture before many of you joined talking about the impacts of the pandemic. And for those of us in Australia, we are looking forward to exiting lockdown. And we are, I'd like to turn now to a question from Alan about the impacts of the pandemic on the use of AI. And particularly, it seems that COVID-19 has really accelerated the application of AI in many areas, particularly in the areas of health, for example but it's also been accelerated in the areas of surveillance, for example, track and trace and checking into the grocery store or checking into your hotel or into the train station. And so is that something to be concerned about, the fact that there is this AI-enabled surveillance? And how should we handle that in the context of trust and responsibility? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it is indeed um, uh, increase of the use of AI in many, in the, in the positive ways. So in the uh, drug discovery, in the medicine, in health, in the, uh, here in Europe, it was also used to uh, trying to predict the number of uh, hospital beds that are needed and how to distribute and the, the logistics of distributing patients by the different hospitals across countries and so on. So there are, have been many uh, positive uh, uses of AI during the pandemic, where probably also the speed through which the vac vaccines have been developed. Uh, and I, I don't know much about it, but I can expect that some of it has been supported by uh, AI uh, technology. But indeed, at the same time, we see an increasingly effort in terms of or increasing use of AI in terms of uh, uh, surveillance, in terms of uh, control uh, mechanisms. Uh, in a sense, uh, I think that we, we, need, we need to be concerned about that. It's, it's always the case that the new tools will uh, lead to new types of uses and experimenting which that, those types of uses is some kind somehow part of the, the, the evolution and the development of different tools, different artifacts, different infrastructures. But that doesn't mean that we do need to accept all different uses of the technology. And we, we definitely don't need to, use, to accept any uh, ways in which technology is used that infringe, infringes on human rights. Again, here is a balance between the many different human rights, the, the, the right to safety, and the, the security, the, the needs to be balanced with the right to privacy, but need, this needs at least to be done in an uh, explicit way, in a transparent way, and in a way in which each of us has the choice to not participate or not join uh, if the if you do not wish that. So we need to, in, in, a, in one hand, yes, people will be uh, experimenting with uh, what are the potential of AI for a set of things. We do need to balance and to understand that there is a, a conflict, potential conflict between many different uh, rights and principles, but at the same time, the, the right to not participating is one which, and to be explicitly informed of the, the use of systems is one which really need to be central. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question here. And, and so I'm going to turn back to more of a technical direction, particularly in the context of all of the data scientists who might be in the audience listening in today. Uh, you've talked a lot about value and choices. You've talked about data exploration and feature selection, model selection within the pipeline of development for AI. But if you think about the world of data science, data science and data scientists as practitioners, 
they're moving back and forth through all of the different steps and choices around data ingestion and data modeling and model development. But how do we, how do we get the population of us who are involved in data analysis to stop and think about how to incorporate all of these considerations in the decision making as we work through that data science pipeline? Is it as simple as going back to the fundamentals of education? Or is there something else we should be thinking about? Ooh, good question. Uh, definitely education is uh, crucial here and understanding that uh, data accuracy is yet one of the principles to aim for but not the single uh, principle we do need to uh, understand that we need to balance accuracy with uh, many other principles uh, privacy with uh, sustainability but also with uh, fairness and so on and the, 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 it's not always the case that more data uh, gets directly to better uh, results. So we really need to start understanding how to uh, balance, uh, like I say, accuracy and the uh, amount of data with um, other, uh, other values and how to, to make these this, uh, informed choices. Uh, so it's, it's one of uh, education, is one also of incentives. Uh, now, as data scientists, the, the main incentive is indeed that of accuracy. But if the main incentive would be, for instance, which some ones are calling intelligence, intelligence by jewel, so uh, intelligence by the use of energy, uh, probably we would get to other results. So I, I would encourage data scientists to really uh, create or exploring different incentives and uh, large uh, conferences in this field really can start having some, uh, some tracks or some uh, competitions in which we look at uh, comparing and uh, solutions, comparing approaches, not from the perspective of just the accuracy, but uh, come up and, uh, with other ways to, to compare and to measure and to uh, validate our, uh, our designs. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to conclude now by giving tremendous thanks, Virginia, for leading this lecture today in the Monash Prato Dialogue series. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. And if there are questions, please feel free to contact me either through social media or through email. I'm always happy to answer. Great. Thank you very much for that generosity. And before we close everyone, I'd also like to invite you to our next lecture in this series on the 18th of November, where we will be hosting Professor Raid Ghani from Carnegie Mellon University in the United States. And Professor Ghani will be giving a lecture on doing good with AI fairly and equitably. We'd also like to invite all of you to stay engaged with the Monash Data Futures Institute and to attend our upcoming events. And we encourage you to follow us on social media, both on LinkedIn and Twitter, and to join our mailing list by signing up for our affiliation program through our website. And you can also visit our website for additional information about the Institute. Thank you again for joining us today. You've been a wonderful audience. And I look forward to welcoming you again to our future lecture series to join in these valuable and provocative discussions. Thank you again, Professor Dignam, for a great event today, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much.